Thanks for uh, spending the last session of the day with us. Uh, appreciate your, your, your willingness to be here. Um, my name is John Plischker. I'm a, a pre-sales solution architect with a company called RainCloud. Uh, I've got uh, Warby Warburton here with me. Warby's a senior product manager with uh, Palo Alto Networks. Uh, I'm going to kind of do the presentation and then uh, depending on the questions and answers, Warby's going to maybe jump in, okay? A uh, little feedback there. Uh, so, tell you what, first off, who's heard of RainCloud? Anybody? All right, we got one. Oh, we got a couple in the back. Uh, so, RainCloud, why am I up here? What, 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 why am I here talking about a transit VPC solution? So, first of all, RainCloud is a, uh, a systems integrator wholly focused on cloud implementations. It's all we do. It's all we've done since we started in 2013. The majority of our work is on AWS, although we do do a little bit with uh, Google as well as Azure. Um, so that's really kind of our story. That's all we do. We're just very focused on that. We're not an enormous company, 300 people. Uh, but laser focused on, on cloud implementations. The only other thing I'm going to highlight there is our focus on uh, different customer segments. When we started out, what we started doing was helping independent software vendors like Palo Alto Networks, like Symantec, like SAP, Cisco, a long list of customers who wanted to take their solution and bring it to the cloud. Uh, and so actually they'd call Amazon and say, hey, we want to get there. We want to get, get our solution on the cloud. What do we do? And Amazon would pair them up with RainCloud and we'd, we'd work with those customers to take their solution and, and, and bring it to the cloud. So we got a lot of experience and exposure doing that um, and specifically with a lot of different independent software vendors. From there, we focused out, we branched out and focused on a lot of different industry segments. And what you'll notice about those industry segments is in most cases, they're regulated industries that have to deal with certain levels of compliance. Uh, and, and the reason I highlight that is because for a lot of those customers, what we have to do is we've got to implement additional security controls or security capabilities to be able to bring their security posture up to address those compliance levels that they're looking to achieve. And that's where companies like Palo Alto Networks come in and, and help us achieve that. So that's kind of our story. We're an AWS partner, a, a Palo Alto partner. Uh, the, 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 that's who we are. We offer really uh, whatever a customer needs in terms of cloud implementation. The only reason I'm going to bring this slide up is our focus area of foundation. When we start working with a customer, especially if they're greenfield and they're just starting to get involved with uh, their, their cloud deployment, AWS deployment, what we're going to look at with them is do they have the proper foundation that aligns with their corporate or security posture that they're looking to achieve. Um, a lot of people, you know, I assume most of you are here because you're somewhat familiar with AWS, but we certainly work with a lot of customers that don't necessarily have a strong foundation. They just want to get some workloads in the cloud, they want to get there as fast as they can, but they haven't necessarily cared for a lot of the security elements that potentially they're going to need. Certainly there's plenty of capabilities that AWS and the other cloud providers offer that you can take advantage of, but in a lot of cases you really need to add additional capabilities like Palo Alto Networks. So that, that's kind of our story. One of the things that we do and one of the reasons I'm really up here is we focus on automating what we do in the cloud. We're 300 plus people. We're not uh, a huge organization that, that can throw bodies at the problem. What we like to do is throw automation at the problem. Uh, and so we focus on really building out automated solutions to be able to deploy these environments on AWS or, or other cloud vendors. Um, what you see on the slide here, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, is just a screenshot on the left side uh, of that, that slide that highlights a platform that our engineering teams use to be able to deploy these solutions. That's a GUI-driven, drag-and-drop type environment to build out packages that get deployed on the cloud. And we've got pre-built blueprints for a lot of the solutions uh, that we deliver, including the solution for Palo Alto Networks. For, for a VM series, we've got a pre-built module for that. And we, we, that's really the way we, 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 we go about deploying these environments. But again, the focus being automation. Foundation, it's getting late. We're, we all want get, to get to our next engagement. I'll just really highlight what I started out with in terms of our focus on foundation. Um, we can start with the basics, which is a basic landing zone, which leverages really native capabilities. 
And then depending upon the customer's needs, we'll start to layer in additional controls like a firewall or a VM series from Palo Alto. Uh, and we can work that all the way up to DOD level compliance levels. Uh, and this is something that we, we, we've got building blocks for in that platform I just showed you, which allows us to roll it out in, in an automated fashion. All right, so that's kind of who we are. I'm not gonna tell you about how great the VM series is. I think you already know that by now. What we're gonna talk about is really the, the Transit VPC. And so, what's the problem that the Transit VPC is really solving? What, what, what is the challenge that, that we're trying to address? Well, if I'm a customer and I've got multiple VPCs in my environment. Let's do a little test here. Anybody have over 100 VPCs in their environment? Anybody? Over 100? Over 50? 20? 10? All right, so you guys start to get a sense as to some of the challenges that, that you start to face in a multi-VPC environment where potentially you need to apply security to each one of those VPCs. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to address it, but that, that, that ultimately becomes a challenge to be able to pull that off, right? To be able to provide really a common set of controls across all your VPCs. Um, and so that's ultimately really the, 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 the challenge that we're trying to focus on is customers that have large environments, uh, you know, there's no magic number in terms of what, what number it is. Maybe you've got an environment that's very dynamic. Uh, you're, you, you, we, as I pointed out, we work with a lot of independent software vendors that run big development shops and developers are spinning up VPCs and tearing them down. But nevertheless, I still need to provide security uh, to, to, to those and, and, and be able to care for that. Um, or I've got an extremely large environment and I want to be able to provide security across that. Um, that's fundamentally really what, what, the, what we're focused on here is how do I address that and how do I secure the communications, whether it be external, internet, uh, on-premise, or whether it be between the VPCs. How, how do I really secure that? So, so that's kind of the, the challenge. Um, how do I do it? Well, Historically, you know, maybe you had a pair of firewalls in your on-prem environment and you could look at actually backhauling the traffic back to those and leveraging those uh, that you had already installed. You've got your, your configurations on them. You can run the traffic through that and manage that. Well, I mean, the challenge with that is you've got to deal with the connectivity back to on-prem. Maybe you need a direct connect. Uh, you potentially are going to run into some latency issues, some bandwidth issues. Um, and if your organization is really embarking on a cloud-centric approach, it's not very cloud-centric. Uh, and so, you know, m maybe that one doesn't really suit your needs. Alternatively, you could look at actually deploying firewalls in each one of the VPCs. Um, nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, the challenge with that ultimately would be, if I've got a lot of VPCs, I've got a lot of firewalls. Uh, and so there's costs associated with that. There's configuration I've got to manage to be able to, to, to roll that out. Uh, and so ultimately it becomes uh, maybe not the best environment in terms of managing. Uh, and so it gets a little more complex. So that, that, that's the other approach. So of course, in comes the, the transit VPC. Uh, and so this is a, think of it as a hub and spoke architecture. Uh, so I've got a centralized hub where I'm able to host my VM series, my firewalls, and now I can control, all, I route all traffic through that, tra all traffic transits through that hub, whether it's going out to the internet, uh, out to my on-premise facilities, or between VPCs. Uh, and so now I'm able to centralize what I'm doing from a security perspective. I'm able to uh, provide that, that common framework to be able to secure that, that communication. Uh, and so I'm also doing it very efficiently because I've centralized it versus distributing it and pushing it out. Uh, and so the concept is that the individual spokes connect to the hub uh, and, and, and you're able to, to apply the security that you need to apply. Makes sense? Good. All right. So if we drill down on that a little bit uh, and start to look at the components, yeah. If you're doing what? Peered links with a shared VPC. VPC peering? Yeah. Yeah, the, the problem with the VPC peering, it's just between the two VPCs, so you're not getting any transit from that point on. Well, you need one VPC shared with multiple. One VPC. No, I don't think you... Yeah, so you, you can peer 
one VPC with multiple, right. but you're not going to be able to go from VPC one right. through a hub to VPC two through the firewall. Because once you add the third, it's now trends are about and AWS doesn't allow that. Okay. What if you're just using, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. No, it's good. Um, It's still, yeah, in that You're case, worried about the other ones to each other. it's still considered routing through and maybe we have to block that. When that package shows up on that IPW, if the destination IP does not match the cider block of that IP, it will be dropped. No, so you have your, your colo, yep. your clinics, yep. you have your first VPC, mm -hmm. and then you have a pure link to multiples over here. Yep. You're not worried about them talking to each other, yep. but you want to talk you know, back to That's what I'm talking about. When that package hits that second VPC, right. so you're, on, you're close to hub, yep. the destination is something beyond that cider block of the VPC itself, it will get dropped. You can't route through even to the internet, even to your colo, through a, an intermediate VPC. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so just in terms of kind of the drill down. So Obviously, we've got the VM series. Uh, we've got two of them. We've got them spread across availability zones. We've got uh, on the subscribing VPCs, the, uh, the, the VGWs to be able to provide the VPN uh, endpoint. And then we've got the IPsec tunnels uh, established between the, the hub and the spoke. We're going to leverage BGP uh, to, to be able to make that uh, reliable. From an HA perspective, uh, you know, we're, we're spreading the load out across those AZs. We've got the multiple VMs. Uh, again, BGP helps us a lot uh, in, in terms of making that highly available. Um, but a solid config from, a, from an availability perspective. So one of the things that we do see, and we've seen, uh, actually I, I've been seeing it uh, from a rain cloud perspective with a lot of our customers, is establishing a shared services configuration. Now in some cases, customers will use the hub as a shared services. In fact, you know, historically, uh, this actually used to be called a services hub uh, model, uh, a services VPC model. We, we've kind of focused now on the transit VPC, but we are seeing a lot of our customers who really look to provide a common set of shared services uh, in a specific uh, shared uh, VPC uh, that they can share across the organization. Um, and really, w one of the things that we've seen specifically, and I'll just kind of give a, a highlight here for those of you who may be interested in it, we've done a decent amount of work in the, in the federal government space, uh, and there's an architecture that they've published about a year ago called the Secure Cloud Compute Architecture. And it's really a set of functional requirements um, that they wanted to establish that all the different agencies within the federal government could use, so they're all essentially speaking the same language. Not everybody needs every requirement that they've outlined and that the architecture supports, but we find even working with our commercial customers with enterprise, large enterprise organizations, that this is a great foundation layer that we can start with. Not everybody needs everything that's there. Not everybody needs every requirement that's there. So we essentially can dial it down or dial it up depending upon what the requirements are. But for anybody who's looking at a shared services model, this is a great resource to potentially go look at and, and, and pull up. Um, because it does provide some great foundation requirements that, that you can leverage. But it really is embracing really the concept of shared services from a security perspective as well as a management perspective. Okay? All right. So you kind of have a sense as to what the Transit VPC architecture is all about, why it's there, and what the purpose of it is. Um, what, what ongoing, what's the problem? Well, Potentially, the challenge is if I've got to manually configure this, uh, ultimately, it, it could turn out to be a fair amount of work. It could be error prone, uh, you know, all, all kinds of issues that go along with that. Uh, and, and as I scale it out even further, my problem just gets bigger. Uh, so for those of you with 100 VPCs, managing this kind of environment can be a challenge, especially if it's a dynamic environment where I've got VPCs coming up and going down. Uh, I, I need to be able to, 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 to have an efficient way to deal with that. Okay? So in, in comes the concept of automation. Uh, and so we, RainCloud, work directly with Palo Alto to help build a solution, an automated approach to be able to deal with that. Not only to 
build out the transit VPC architecture, the, the hub VPC, as well as the subscribing VPCs, but to be able to manage the subscription and unsubscription that the subscribing VPCs are doing as, the, as they're working with the transit hub, okay? So how do we do that? We use a series of building blocks available to us from AWS. Uh, we started with CloudFormation, so the, really the whole framework is driven by CloudFormation. Uh, we're leveraging, as I pointed out before, the, the, the V gateways uh, to provide the, the VPN endpoint. Um, we're using S3 uh, as a storage bucket for a variety of elements, for configuration elements, for the, the bootstrap, uh, when I want to bring up the VM series, for logging goes into the S3 buckets. Uh, we're leveraging CloudTrail as a way of actually triggering some of the activities that actually occur. And so when, when certain things happen in a subscribing VPC, CloudTrail helps us with that in terms of being able to, to, do, uh, to, to provide us those triggers. Um, we've got DynamoDB, so we've got a series of tables that help us uh, keep track of some of the, the pooling elements that we're using, some of the configuration elements uh, that the solution has. Uh, we're leveraging Lambda, uh, really as the execution portion of the whole solution. Uh, we've got uh, you know, a series of different Lambdas uh, to allow us to do what it, what it is we're doing. There's one specific element that's really the state machine uh, that's using step functions. Uh, that's really kind of the core brain behind, behind the solution. And a series of ancillary uh, Lambdas that, that allow us to do different functions as part of the solution. Uh, simple queuing service, notification service uh, are, are, are also part of it. And of course, we're leveraging the VM series, we're leveraging the bootstrapping capabilities, uh, API, and then uh, optionally Panorama uh, for, for managing the configuration. So those are really the building blocks that go into the solution. Um, there's uh, you know, really a great uh, set of documentation on GitHub where this is posted. Uh, so, you know, you can really drill into the, the specifics of that. So, what's the process I go through? Um, CloudFormation people who's done CloudFormation, created a CloudFormation stack? Okay, great. All right, so, so there's really not much in terms of actually building this out. For those of you who haven't done any CloudFormation, I'm not talking about actually writing CloudFormation. I'm talking about just creating a stack. Uh, in AWS. So you get into your console, you get in specifically to the CloudFormation console, and then there's a series of configuration steps you've got to do. Um, you've got to actually upload some of the files that are in GitHub to an S3 bucket. That's really your first step in the process. Then you go and create uh, a new stack. There's actually four specific elements to the, the, the creation, um, or four specific CloudFormation templates. The first is you need to run in the account that you're going to be hosting your hub. Uh, by the way, the solution supports multi-accounts, so I could have my hub in one account and my subscribing VPC in a different account. I can have them all in the same account. Uh, it doesn't matter. But the first step in the, in the process is to actually initiate the hub account. And so there's a CloudFormation template for that. Um, you go into the, the console, the CloudFormation console, you run that. You essentially brings up a set of parameters that you need to fill in, name, SSH, uh, you know, there's IP addresses, a, a series of elements, you know, 20 or so elements that you need to define as part of building that out. There's a good user guide to kind of drive you through it. Uh, and then you run that, and essentially that's going to create the hub environment uh, including the lambdas, uh, you know, including IAM roles, uh, the S3 uh, log information is going to get built out. But essentially, it's going to build out that environment in the hub. What it doesn't do is actually build out the VM series yet. That comes later. Um, but now you've got all the elements there in, in, in the hub account to be able to, to, to facilitate that. The next piece in the equation is you run it, and it goes through a series of steps to be able to build it out. Uh, you know, it could take a handful of minutes to be, before it uh, actually deploys. Uh, now we need to focus on the subscribing side of the equation. Uh, and so in the account that's going to host the subscribing VPCs, I need to initialize that as well. Uh, and so I've got to run through a very similar process where I, I go through, create a stack, run the specific CloudFormation uh, JSON file, I've got to load that. Uh, it runs through a series of steps. Again, uh, you know, some parameters I can find to answer in the, in the GUI. Uh, and boom, now the subscribing uh, account that's going to host my subscribing VPCs has been initialized. And again, it's doing the same thing. It's loading out the lambdas. It's doing IAM roles. 
uh, so forth. Um, so now I've got essentially the environment ready for automation to actually occur. W when I roll that out, I've got options to actually build out a subscribing VPC, or I could actually initialize an existing VPC to now initiate the process of the subscription, to actually make the association with the hub. Uh, and so there, there's options and flags there to be able to allow you to do that. Now I've got the environment there, I'm ready to go. Uh, at this point, now I need to trigger the actual connection and the rollout of the VM series in the hub. And so as part of it, what I need to do is trigger it by having, and it's the very last element there on that list, I need to have a tag that says subscribing VPC equals yes. And this is the scenario if you had an existing uh, VPC, I'd initiated it, now that tag would appear, I'd go in and trigger it by assigning a yes value there. At that point, now it starts to build out the whole solution. So now my VM series are gonna get built out in the hub. They're gonna get deployed. Gotta get the animation caught up here. Uh, it's gonna establish the V gateway in the subscribing VPC. It's going to establish the VPNs, redundant VPNs to the two different VM series that I've got. Uh, and it's gonna roll the whole solution out just by adding that, tr that tag of yes in that value. And of course, in reverse, if I change that value to no or I delete that tag, boom, it's gonna tear that environment down. Um, very easy to use solution, uh, very kind of, uh, although in the back end it's doing a tremendous amount of stuff, but fairly simplistic in terms of the way you have to launch it. Um, you know, anybody who's interested in trying, I, I went through it this morning just to make sure uh, everything was kind of kosher with it and it was all working great. It, it took like half an hour just to kind of run through it. So uh, for anybody who's interested in just kind of kicking the tires and, and testing it out, um, it, it's not a big investment in terms of time. Uh, so that, that's kind of the story on the solution. Um, now, what do we do for environments that uh, are larger? And so the number of subscribing VPCs is really starting to scale out. How am I gonna scale out the solution? Well, again, the automation is there to be able to provide for that. Um, so at some point, I'm gonna exceed the capacity of the VM series. Um, one of the parameters that I define when I'm building the initial, when I'm initializing the initial, the hub account, is what's the ratio of subscribing VPCs to the VM series or to what we consider the pair of them, the, the, the Palo Alto group is the way we've defined it in the solution. Uh, and so you define that parameter. And so when you reach that parameter, it's actually gonna spin up a new pair of VM series. And so that new, you know, let's say the, the, the value was eight. When I get to the ninth, it's gonna spin up a new pair of VM series and now assign that new subscribing VPC to that new pair. Uh, and that's kind of the way it's gonna roll out. And then we've also included a function in there that you could schedule that actually is a rebalancing operation. And so it'll rebalance the load just based on the number. It, it's not more advanced than that in terms of the, the value there. But it, it's a nice little feature to have to be able to, to deal with that if, you, if your environment has been fairly dynamic. Uh, and so that's cared for in, in, in the automation logic, all right? So really, that, that's kind of the story in terms of the solution and, and what it's able to do. I encourage you guys to kind of give it a try. Um, at the end of the day, it's an elegant way to be able to solve this problem if you've got a, a, a fairly dynamic or a large environment with multiple VPCs uh, to be able to address it. Um, questions? We're going to let the product manager handle that one. <laughs> See if I can get the mic to work. All right. Well, this one's very quiet. I'll yell while he makes the adjustment. So the question was around bandwidth limitations. So the VGW itself, which is the attachment for each scope VPC, it has a limit. It's not documented, but it's around one and a half gig today. So that's going to be your per VPC limit. So if you have a very large VPC with a lot of uh, traffic requirements, you're going to need another solution, and there's things we can do there. Um, but if you have a lot of VPCs, that's probably not going to be the limit you're going to hit. Uh, many customers, according to AWS, who have worked with them, have said, oh, yeah, I've got you know dozens or hundreds of VMs. I'm going to need lots and lots of throughput. And then they do some measurements, and it's like tens of meg, because it's not all happening at once, right? Um, 
On our side, we have data sheets that talk about the numbers based on the VM series model number and how much compute you give it, C4, extra large, 2X, 4X, whatever it is. So we publish that, that, those metrics. So based on that, you can calculate what that ratio should be so that after X number of spokes, we now need another pair of firewalls to handle the additional throughput. The nice thing is that the solution fully automates that. So literally when you get to N plus one, the new pair comes. And it's really cool the way they implemented it is, let's say your ratio was 10 to one and you were deploying an 11th and deleting the third. They will prioritize the deletion, finish that, attach the 11th into its position and not give you the extra firewalls because you didn't actually need them. So when there's two queuing up, it'll delete first to save you money so you're not adding more firewalls that you didn't actually need. Uh, so it's on our data sheet. Um, let's see, the best way to get there, so I mean. The, the GitHub? The GitHub's there, isn't it? Sorry? Oh, that's a good, yeah, that's a good landing page. So aws.paloaltonetworks.com. There's resources at the bottom, including the data sheet for all the virtual firewalls. This page that John's showing now is our landing page for all of our cloud integrations, including the transit VPC. Um, this, this is actually an old screenshot. There's actually quite a bit more, and there's more being added all the time. So it's a great place to go to see not only the transit VPC and its evolution as it grows over time, but all the other integrations that we're talking about this week and that we don't even have time to get to. So really good stuff on that page. You want to? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I think, so if I understand the question is, how can you connect an on-prem data center into this environment, whether it's directly to the firewalls or through a VGW or direct connect? So you have multiple options. Um, typically for larger deployments, there's probably gonna be a direct connect, and so you're gonna do some BGP peering to carry the routes all the way through the architecture. You could, if you don't trust that last top, you could actually terminate the IPsec tunnel all the way to those virtual firewalls all the way back to your on-prem. And you could even onboard multiple data centers that way and do BGP pairing, so you have dynamic routing. Typically, you're gonna have regional hubs, so you're gonna have a transit VPC hub per region, and maybe each of those hubs comes back to the local data center. That's the most common architecture for that. Mm -hmm. You had to have a load balancer in the same VPC. Yep. And I didn't get this far, but just thinking about it as if we were getting into the, you know, using auto scaling Palo Altos with that, yep. I had the feeling that those would probably have to be in the same VPC as well. Yep. So, how does that mesh with this, you know, because we were trying to do it in this kind of argument? Sure. Can you flip back to the diagram, please? That's fine. That one's fine. So the question was about, uh, you know, one of the benefits of the cloud is I can build an application that will automatically scale, which means I need a load balancer and I need an auto scaling group, and how does that fit into this architecture? In most cases, some of those spokes, some subset of those spokes have an internet facing piece. You might have traditionally called it a DMZ. So we would layer something like our auto scaling integ integration, which I'll plug I'm presenting on tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> on that particular spoke. Now we are working on a way to actually integrate all of that into the hub using things like pairing and endpoints and things like that. So we're working on that and I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about that. But today you can layer on top some internet facing security with or without load balancing, with or without auto scaling in any of these spokes. The two are independent and they can be used together and often are. So you wouldn't face the spoke directly Yes. Yeah, I would typically do the spokes, only the spokes that need it would have an internet facing piece and that tends to be more bursty so I would make that auto scaling. Whereas this is VPC to VPC security or back and forth on-prem, you know, SSH or RDP from your IT team, whatever that may be. By the way, 
as you've been hearing about all week, you should be turning on multi-factor authentication, app ID, all those other protections in that hub to secure those spokes. How about here? So the question was how many tunnels are being built every time you add a spoke essentially. And as you pointed out, when you spin up a VGW, if you export that config, you're gonna see exactly two tunnels. But if I just did two tunnels to one firewall, I've got a single point of failure. So I do two tunnels per firewall. So I have full redundancy and I use BGP to fail over in the case of any failure, whether it's a firewall, a VGW failure, failure for some reason that tunnel went down, whatever it is, BGP will quickly reconverge. You're, you're on both, uh, on the exactly. Redundancy on both ends, so I end up with four fully, and by the way, this was all built automatically. So this solution, just like he said, by tagging at VPC, all the tunnels and routing are done for you, which is the beauty of it. Over here. Okay, yeah, yep. Yeah, so the, the question is about a 13 VPN re, uh, per region uh, limitation. So it wasn't 13, it was 13-ish. So what happened was every V, yeah, yeah. So every VGW would say, you must use this 169 dot whatever IP, the slash 30 for the peering of BGP. Uh, late last year, AWS finally lets you specify that subnet. So that restriction is gone, which made this automation possible. So this will scale to hundreds of VPCs with no conflict. The DynamoDB he mentioned earlier is tracking those subnets. And we tell the VGW, use this subnet that won't collide. So yeah, great point. Uh, that problem is now gone, thankfully. Yeah, let's try out here in the back. Yeah, so the, the, one, the question was about the 1.5 gig throughput limitation. That's on the VGW when it's doing IPsec. When the VGW is doing direct connect, it's just peering, there is no IPsec, and then it'll do ones or tens of gig. It's quite a bit more. I think it'll go far beyond tens. So for direct connect, you don't have that limit. It's only when the VGW is doing IPsec that you hit that, which is different than direct connect. Yeah. 1.25, okay, that's the more accurate number. Oh, it's documented? When did that happen? We have the expert in the room, so we got the AWS guys here, which is great. By the way, there were some earlier questions about the transit VPC, so Nick Matthews in the back did an excellent session at reInvent, all deep dive just in transit architectures, and it's available on their YouTube channel. So if this is new to you, have a look at it, it's really helpful. And it talks about not just the security of it, but all the routing and everything else. Panorama, um, he pointed out, was optional. Highly recommended because these firewalls are going to come and go as your spokes come and go. Probably they're mostly just coming because you're adding spokes. But if it's a development environment with a lot of churn, the way you can manage those configs is you can do bootstrapping. But if you want to push new policy, and you have to now update, update your bootstrap config or use something like Ansible. But if these are bootstrapping into Panorama, then whenever you change policy in Panorama and you hit push, all the current firewalls and all the ones you haven't even spun up automatically in the future will have that change. So we don't require Panorama, but we strongly recommend it. Makes it much easier. Now, if you have other tools you like, like the new uh, Terraform provider or the Ansible examples we have, you can absolutely use those. But Panorama will do all this for you. Yeah, so the question was, what is BGB using for, being used for? Yeah, it's, it is for failover. So the VGW, that is the dynamic routing protocol it supports, is, is BGP. We also use the, uh, we, we modify it so that we, or we don't modify it, but we make sure that the firewalls are symmetrical. So whichever one is active 
in one direction is also the active one in the other direction, so we don't have asymmetric routes because there are four tunnels going to that VPC. Yes. We cannot load balance that today. They used to do ECMP, but it was a different platform. Um, for now, it is one active. Yep. Like I said, if that VPC got very large and you really needed more throughput, there's there's other solutions that we can do. Uh, no, I don't think we hit any limits. Jason, have you hit anything? Yeah. So we're good. Uh, how about back here? For the which association? So there, there are no VLANs here like there are with Direct Connect. It, yeah, so, so if you imagine further left, there was a Direct Connect behind that. Once it gets to that hub, VLANs are no longer relevant. So you decide which networks are going to route over that based on the routing going all the way back, typically BGP. But at this point forward, it's just pure layer three routing. Only on the Direct Connect, Colo hardware, router, firewall, whatever you're using there, which is independent of this. That's, that's still up to you and completely flexible. AWS will assign the VLANs based on which VPC you want to attach. So if you're attaching this transit to your Direct Connect, that'll be already told, like, you need to use these VLANs to terminate it. From that point on, though, it's just pure routing. So that's just... Basically, forget about the spokes. You've just onboarded a single VPC via Direct Connect. That's no different. That doesn't change. Yeah, so for cross-region, I wouldn't onboard spokes to one hub, like spokes on the West Coast and the East Coast to only a West Coast hub, because you're bouncing traffic across the country twice to secure to, I would repeat the hub in each region. If you wanted to, you could connect the hubs together cross region, or you could backhaul them via di uh, direct connect or any other method to your on-prem. That's up to you, independent of this. Yeah, so Cisco has a routing version of this. It's been around for at least a year. Um, I wouldn't say it replaces it, it's just another solution. They're also doing BGP and routing like we are, it's just that they don't, they have like ACL style security because it's a router. This is the same functionality but with PanOS goodness on top. Yeah, I'm about, like, your oh yeah, yeah, so you don't need Cisco CSRs here necessarily, you can eliminate them, yep. And there was a question right next. So the question is, uh, is all the traffic going through the, the, the tunnels, basically, back to the hub? Yeah, exactly. So you could add an IGW to a spoke and go directly to internet. I personally don't recommend it, because I work at Palatine Networks, and I want you to do app ID whitelisting. I want you to turn on wildfire. I want you to secure that. But from a routing perspective, absolutely, you could do that. Yeah, so the question is where should the internet connection should be, should it be? I would say in the transit, because those VM series firewalls will absolutely learn the default route to the IGW if you want them to. And so now some device needs to go do an APT get or an MS update. It'll come to the hub. You'll apply the policy, hopefully via Panorama, and let it out to the internet if it's allowed and not going to command and control server and all the other things that you should be protecting. Anyone I'm missing in the back? How about here? Sure. Yep. So the question was, how do the spokes learn the IGW? So what happens is the spokes are going to learn their normal default route, the dot one or whatever, the subnet. The VGW, when we set this up, will automatically propagate a default route into the local route table. So when this, anything in that spoke needs to talk to the internet, because there is no IGW there, it'll default route to the VGW, and the only path is to get to the hub, 
And then we decide, should we allow it? Is it secure? Are we going to route it on-prem out to the internet to another transit or another spoke? But yeah, it, the VGW takes care of that. Well, that's one of the beauties of this solution is I don't have to put some custom AMI over there, figure out how to scale it and dynamically route it and fail over. The VGW does all that for me. Yep. Yeah, great question. I have the perfect answer. So the question was, if we choose to use Panorama, but we have bootstrapping, how do we attach it? So there is a feature which is underutilized, but it's amazing. You can go into Panorama and generate a key that authorize a bootstrap device to join a device group and a template. So in the bootstrap config, you say, what's the Panorama IP? What's the key? What device group should I join in the template? And on boot, it'll reach out. Panorama will say, yep, you have the right key. Here is your config, your current config. So it's very slick, and it's a very powerful solution because yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you Google Palatine Network's Panorama Bootstrap, you'll see how to do the auth key. Um, trying, is there an easier way, Jason, to get to that? But the, yeah, it's in the admin guide. If you have trouble, send me an email. I'll help you out. Yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, on the way bootstrapping works in AWS is you create an S3 bucket and you create four folders. Uh, there still is a limitation for now that those four folders have to be the top level of that bucket. We are looking at changing that. It hasn't happened yet. And I get why it's, it would be nice to have. For now, you have to create a unique bucket. You can, uh, like for our auto scaling solution, you can use that bucket for other things, but the bootstrap config folders do have to be at the top. Yeah. Yeah, that's another request we get is actually specifying the master key. Um, I think Jigger is working on that. Let's talk with him offline. But yeah, I, I understand the request. You're not the only one. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Default from a route perspective? You mean on the spoke? Yeah. So you're asking uh, what's advertised in the spoke for the default route? Yeah, so the, the AMI boots up and it goes out to DHCP and says, what's my default gateway? And it's just going to get the, the first IP of the subnet, usually dot one. That doesn't change. That directs the traffic to the AWS router for that subnet. When this is deployed, the VGW, if you actually look at the route table, you'll see propagated route on the VGW, yes which means that the route from the VGW itself becomes the next hop for everything. So the route table lookup that gets hit when it hits the dot one says, go to the VGW. The VGW says, take the tunnel. The firewall says, do your thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, if you walk through, so there's some videos and deployment guides. If you walk through it and you look in the console at the route table, you'll see a VGW entry instead of an IGW. Yeah, so the, so the question is, you know, should we only, should we have specific routes or only the default? My preference is default to the VGW, bring it to the firewall, let the firewall see what's going on. I may still block it, but now I have a log of something that happened that I didn't expect. So maybe I could block it sooner, but I've lost the visibility. I'd rather get all that information into Panorama or better yet, logging service so we can enable all the app framework stuff that Lee talked about. So just bring it all to the hub and then let us, Allow, deny, but definitely log. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about back here? You probably want to build some additional tunnels from the VM series to your local VGW. That's what you have to 
Yeah, so, so. What we saw was as the firewall was learning the, the network from the subscribers, did you run into an issue because the in theory of what it's learning from Amazon is it says it can do more? It won't re advertise the subscribers. Yeah, so, so depending on how you've connected this hub back on prem, you can do a VGW direct connect. You don't have to tunnel the firewalls to that VGW. You can actually BGP route all the way through. And that does work, we've tested that. Yeah, so it's not required to tunnel and it's actually easier if you don't. The only reason I would tunnel to the firewall is if you had a requirement because of the vertical you're in to IPsec encrypt all the way back on-prem. And then actually the routing becomes even simpler because there's no routed hops between at that point. Yeah. So the, the VGW dictates eBGP peering. That's, it's, it's a static config. You don't get a lot of options in that. It basically tells you here's the config you must use with the advantages of now we can do like the slash 30 specification and things like that. Yep. Yeah, good question. So I don't know if everyone heard that. So the question is, I have now deployed a second pair of firewalls and something in spoke one on the first pair needs to talk to spoke 11 on the second pair. So part of the automation is we do automatically BGP peer the firewalls themselves so they can learn from each other, oh, you're responsible for those 10 spokes and I'm responsible for these 10. Go to the other firewall pair to get out to the other spoke. Good question. Yeah. Uh, VMC on AWS, uh, I'm not familiar with any specific integrations, Jason or Matt. The, the, I'm sorry, the question was, uh, do we have any VMC integrations with AWS? Yeah, not that I'm familiar with either. Is there anyone like trying to answer a question, ask a question over here and I'm completely ignoring you because I didn't see you? So between the two firewalls, they are paired as well because, uh, actually, I don't think they are because there's only one active, yeah. The pairs are not right. Additional yeah. So one pair is paired with the next and the next, but within, there's only one active and, okay. yep. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is for inbound traffic from the internet, should it flow through the hub or directly into a spoke? Um, we don't dictate that. Most of the customers today, the easiest thing to do is do that on the spoke for that specific application because that's probably a different security profile. There, you could do it through the hub, but now you're gonna hit that bandwidth limit over that IP suck tunnel, whereas if you do on the spoke, you just have whatever the EIP egress bandwidth is, so you'll get a lot more performance to do it on the spoke. Yep. Yeah, because if you come inbound right to the spoke, you can put a load balancer like an AOB in front of it and scale very high in, in throughput. Now, if you don't have that need, you could do it the other way. It's up to you. Oh, okay. Excellent. So if you didn't hear that, there is progress on the VMC integration. You can go by the AWS booth and the expo and they'll fill you in. Yep. 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 Yeah, so the question is, if I add an IGW to one of the spokes to allow traffic from the internet, now I've got essentially two default routes. So my recommendation is default route to the VGW, source net on the virtual firewall, which has the public IP or is going through the load bouncer, so it goes back symmetrically that way. But all the traffic initiated from the VPC goes through the hub, which has the outbound policy. Yep. 
Come tomorrow, I will spend an hour on exactly that topic. Um, but yeah, it's the, AL, it's the load balancer sandwich with firewalls and the application scaling independently and even multiple applications behind one security stack. I will go through the entire architecture. Are you not able to attend? Okay, so if you go to the aws.paltonetworks.com landing page, there's a whole explanation of this or catch me afterwards and we'll go into it. There was a question, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, in, in the, when I attach a new VPC, is it coming in on a new zone? So the way the automation is built today, the, it's coming on a unique tunnel. Um, I think we map them, Jason, don't we map them all to the same zone right now? Yeah, so you can use... Okay. So you can remap them to a different zone. You can also use address objects if you know what each CIDR block is, or even VM tagging, although there's a scale limit today of 10 VPCs. So you have some options there. By the way, we always get questions like, hey, this is great, but I want to modify it a little bit, like zones or something. RainCloud is available to engage with you to tweak this to whatever you need, right? You don't have to just use it as is and you're stuck. There's, if you either, you can modify it freely because it's all freely available under Apache 2, or you can engage them or another cloud provider if you're working with one cloud partner to help you make those kind of modifications. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is, is the template specific to a PanOS version? So the template has hard-coded AMIs, but you can just edit the template, change it to whatever AMI you want, and in addition, you can bootstrap to a dot release, like a maintenance release on top of that. So it's very flexible. Yep. Anything else? Okay, we'll stick around for a little bit if you're shy. Oh, do you have, one more. How does the work reference to the so the question is, as you scale this out, basically, how do you automate the connection all the way back to the direct connect? So that part is not there. So either this is a small scale and you have a single pair and you're done, or you have to add that on top of it. I don't know, Jason, have you encountered anyone who's tackled that? Yeah, we end up having tunnels coming through the direct connect, Can you bootstrap the, the BGP part of the firewall to automate that? Okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is if I have Palo Alto Networks firewalls in the Direct Connect colo that I'm terminating, can I bring the tunnels directly to that? So. There's two parts to that. One is this solution won't automate that for you, but you don't actually need tunnels at that point because it's not a VPC, so the transitive routing problem doesn't happen. Um, it would require a significant modification, but you could fully automate that because even the hardware firewalls have the same API, so you can automate the auto attachment. It's just this code would have to be modified. And we have customers that do that. I don't know if, we, if anyone has automated it, but we absolutely have customers that bring all their VPCs to hardware firewalls because they want to do SSL decryption and they have high performance requirements or whatever. Yep. Yep. Good question. Anything else? All right. Thank you. We'll hang around. Thanks.